I think a compelling argument for him having a slightly homosexual side is that, first of all, why wouldn't you, if you were on your own in there, and in disguise, remember, so you left yourself uh, back at the officer's mess. A curious man like him, presented with a, you know, lubricated bumhole, must have thought, well, why not? Richard Burton was 21 when he first came to India, and he didn't take long to find his way here, Bombay's red light district. It had been created for British soldiers looking for some Eastern passion. For Burton and his fellow officers, it was like walking into a sweet shop. We spent nights in a place of dissipation, to put it mildly, the Bendy Bazaar whose attractions consisted of dark young persons in gaudy dress, mock jewels, and hair japanned with coconut oil, about which the less said the better. But after a few bawdy visits, Burton's curiosity deepened. As he would have done, I wanted to go and actually talk to some of the working girls myself. Hello, I'm Rupert. Hello. Hi. How are you? And how long have you been working here, girls? How many years have you been here? Six years. Six years. And how did you get started? And Make them forced to force. involve in this business. Right. And mum and dad, are they, where are they? They don't know that they are, uh, they are involved in this particular business. They, they, know, they, they, they know that they are doing some service. And whatever they earn, they, you know, they are sending money from here to village. And do either of them have children? I also see them and they also have their money. Uh, she has got uh, two children. Mm. One is of one month, one month. She's earning the business. Where is the baby? She's the uh, baby. Where is the baby? Where is the Yes, she's the baby there inside. Oh, can we see? Oh, look at the little baby. One month baby. This is one month baby. It's a very good baby. Is it a girl or a boy? It's a girl. It's a boy. It's a boy. And you have another baby too? Three years old. Three years old. And where does the three year old, girls? And where she live? It's in an orphanage. It's in a boarding, boarding school. So you never see? No. No. And will this one, this baby go to orphanage? Yes, he has to go. Like this one, like this. This is the way we live in India. The pity situation. That was a shocking scene, and Burton must have seen something similar in his day. After all, in the 1840s, hundreds of illegitimate babies were born to Indian women as British officers slept their way through the local population. But salvation was at hand. After a Saturday night with the girls in the Bindi Bazaar, on Sunday morning the British could deposit their guilt here in St. Thomas's Cathedral. The bastard babies of English officers and their local women boo-boos were baptized here, saving their souls. Lieutenant George Harris Dickinson, whose death was occasioned by exposure to the sun while carrying into execution with his characteristic zeal the works upon which he was employed. You're right, Dickinson. Yes, sir. <laughs> Clunk. There's no plaques anywhere around here to poor old Richard Burton. Um, he was not a man trusted by um, his fellow officers. Burton's time in India was making him increasingly suspicious of Victorian Christian morality. I sense a split in his head. Still up for empire, still up for a bloody fight. But he was increasingly horrified by the behavior of the British towards the natives. I think the English sexuality vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the boo-boos was a mixture of horror, lust, disgust, and all those things that make the kinky English sexual psyche, you know. Um, I don't think they wanted to, on the whole, live with them. I think they, were, they, they saw them as animals, sort of. They didn't see them as human beings. Obviously, boo-boos had babies, and since rather inconveniently they tried to stop infanticide, <laughs> Uh, they couldn't, you know, say, put it down, just kill it. 
uh, they baptise these babies and put them in orphanages. I think Burton hit the nail on the head when he said that the more he studied religion, the more he was convinced that man never worshipped anything but himself. Very soon after his arrival in India, Burton shacked up with his own boo-boo. She was a Nautch dancer called Noor Jan. Even though Nautch girls were simple classical dancers, their eroticism was seen as a threat to discipline. And by the 1880s, the Raj set about stamping them out. Those disapproving attitudes persist today. Their successors are barely legal, and you need insider knowledge to find them. Noor Jan meant more to Burton than just sex. She was his teacher and textbook, and he argued that having an intimate relationship with a local woman helped officers of the Raj to understand the people they governed. She is all but indispensable to the student, and she teaches not only Hindustani grammar, but the syntaxes of native life. When Burton writes about dancing girls, Norse girls, you have this image of, of Indian villages at night where everyone, everything's quiet, there's only fire or candles, and then you hear out of the darkness coming these girls with bells on their toes and brightly colored silks and beautiful black hair and jewelry. You just have this feeling of these kind of visions come to yeah. life, really. Uh, you know, this is before cinema, before theatre, before uh, any sense of visual stimulation apart from what you saw there. Reading about it, it must have been, well, the same as, as, as having a vision of, uh, of, of gods and stuff and goddesses. You must have just been entranced by it. As Burton went deeper and deeper, he realised that his boo-boo was part of an ancient culture which treated sex very differently to the hypocritical Victorians. Listen, I should be carrying him. Yes. I've got one rather short guy here. I have to hold on for dear life. Burton came to the 7th century Hindu carvings of Elephanta Island. Here was the embodiment of the free, open and uninhibited view of sex integral to Hindu belief. The Christian notion of shame simply did not exist. My guide is Shapita Punja an expert on Hindu eroticism, and Richard Burton. So what's going on here? This is perhaps the most beautiful sculpture of Shiva in a form where he's half woman and half man. The idea is a philosophical one. It suggests that within every man and every woman there is the other Amazing. half, the male and female. And it's when it comes into perfect balance that you reach that, that part of your evolution that's necessary. Books like The Scented Garden and things that, that Burton read. Uh, and was, translated. Yes, and translated were all this celebration of the body and, and being together and relationships. And I think that's why he thrilled in them. I think that's why he really enjoyed uh, them because they were so different. It's such a contrast. <laughs> yes. All the corsets and bones and underwear. I, I mean, like to get through to an yeah, English lady's yeah. body, you had to hack your way in. <laughs> By 1845, Burton's regiment was stationed in Sindh, northern India. But by now, his grasp of languages and intimacy with the locals was so impressive that he had become a perfect spy for the British Empire, a Victorian James Bond. Asked to gather information, he invented the disguise as a travelling cloth merchant, Misra Abdullah. As he drifted ever further from his fellow officers, they began to call him White Nigger. Being an actor means there's some kind of psychological hole inside of you, uh, in terms of identity. And, uh, uh, and the actor always feels happier when he's dressed up. And so I think Burton also felt released from himself when he was dressed up. And I think Burton very much came to life uh, in disguise. His sexuality, which is often uh, under discussion, I get the feeling that that also possibly came to life uh, when he was uh, Abdullah. But he would soon be given a task which would cause a scandal for the rest of his life. 